So hello everyone. Hello. Hello. I'm Chen Hong, uh, currently a fourth year PhD candidate from the POM group of MSE. And uh, thank you all for coming to my PhD oral defense. We have quite some people here today. I'm not sure whether it's for me or for the Chinese food. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I hope you will enjoy this one hour long presentation. Uh, my dissertation title is Blue Channel Sourcing and Selling Strategies in Operations Management. We know that today's business environment is highly uncertain, and it is crucial for manufacturers and suppliers to be able to adapt themselves to the changing market conditions. And my dissertation therefore investigates how firms can utilize multiple channels to efficiently acquire production and service capacity or distribute sales volumes to meet the needs of a dynamic market. In particular, it includes two separate problems. On the sourcing side, I will study a dual-mode equipment procurement strategy for capital-intensive industry. Basically, how can a firm procure the production capacity from two different supply modes to minimize the procurement cost? This is based on research that I did with Intel Corporation um, for several years, and it covers the first two major chapters of my dissertation. And the second part is on the selling side. I studied a strategical capacity allocation problem in commodity trading with a spot market. So in particular, how can a spot uh, commodity supplier utilize different channels to distribute the sales volumes to enhance its revenue performance? And it covers the third major chapter of my dissertation. And uh, I will start with the first part. As I mentioned, this is a research based on a project that I did with Intel. So he, here is the motivation. Why should we care about equipment procurement. As you see from this picture, the equipment that we talk about here are these complex big machines that Intel Corporation uses to manufacture the computer chips. Equipment capacity is very expensive to build. Equipment expenditure often constitutes 20 to 30 percent of the total revenue and about 60 percent of the manufacturing costs. And Intel in particular spent 5.3 billion US dollars annually on equipment procurement in the past five years. On the other hand, Equipment procurement decision is difficult to make due to four reasons. First, demand in this industry is highly uncertain. Second, the shortages are very costly because we know computer chips are usually sold at very high prices. Third, the lead times for this equipment are very long. It can be as long as quarters or even years to manufacture this complex machine. And lastly, the equipment capacity is cumulative and overinvestment is irreversible. So unlike inventory, if you hold some inventory today, you can still get rid of them tomorrow right, by selling them. But if you have idle capacity, it will always just sit there. So it will be a waste uh, in terms of the investment. So we think this is both economically challenging and practically interesting problem to solve. Intel, however, used to overpurchase. As you can see from this graph, each column here demonstrates a past generation of technology. And the gray part denotes the portion of capacity that remains idle at the uh, technical peak level stats. So basically, the, the current capital procurement strategy has resulted in excess capital of 5 to 30 percent after the realization of peak level stats per technology. And given four-year depreciation, Intel has overspent almost $2 billion over the last seven technologies. And the reason is Intel really values customer satisfaction a lot. So they think it's the crucial, it's most important to satisfy the demand from the customers. Therefore, Intel deliberately err on the side of having idle capacity. But we think there is definitely ways to reduce this inefficiency without hurting the customer satisfaction. So that's why we proposed a dual-mode procurement strategy for Intel. So we ask Intel to now purchase the equipment from two different service modes provided by the equipment supplier. One base mode, which has a longer lead time and a cheaper price. And another is a flexible mode, which has a shorter lead time and a much expensive price. So for the firm, Intel, the long lead time source will enable a cost advantage because it's cheaper, right? The short lead time source will allow a fast reaction to the dynamic market. And we will also incorporate a demand forecast updating process, which will allow better information during the procurement execution stage. However, we don't want to hurt the suppliers. We want to somehow you know, share some risk with the supply as well. So for the suppliers, we actually have introduced a capacity reservation stage, which will guarantee a certain profit for the supplier upfront. That is, we will actually you know, uh, ask Intel to 
pay uh, some money to the supplier upfront and reserve some capacity. It's like buying options. So in this way, we can share some risk with them. And the capacity reservation, as well as the differential pricing scheme, will also distribute the risk between the Intel and its equipment suppliers. So we think this strategy can be a long-term win-win solution for both the firm and its equipment suppliers. More details about problem setting. We will study a finite horizon periodic review do supply modes equipment procurement problem, where the flexible mode has a short lead time and a high overall price. The overall price includes a reservation price that you pay upfront and the execution price where you actually order the equipment. The base mode has a <coughs> sorry, longer lead time and a lower price. We assume that the unsatisfied demand every period is backlogged and a high penalty is incurred for any unmet demand at the end of the planning horizon. So if we allow it back out, but if at the end of the horizon you still cannot satisfy some of the demand, you do have to pay a high penalty for that. And we assume profit margin is decreasing over time. So that means that this serves as another penalty for back order, right? If you, yeah, sure, you can accumulate the order and next period to sell it, but you will only be able to sell it at a lower price. So there is definitely additional penalty for back ordering. We assume the raw material supply is always sufficient, hence we only concentrate on the capacity decision problems, we ignore the inventory problems. We assume the firm is risk neutral and determines the optimal equipment ordering scheme from the both supply modes to maximize its total expected profit. So that's the setting. Briefly uh, mention the literature. So three areas of literature are related to this problem. The first is do solve inventory control problems, which has already been which has been studied since 1960s. The other is capacity expansion and capacity contraction, and the last one is demand forecast updating. So I want to in particular mention two papers. One is by SETI et al. 2001. They study a dual source inventory control problems with demand forecast updates and assuming 0 1 consecutive lead times for the supply modes. The other paper is by Chow et al. 2009. They study a dual source capacity expansion problem but as they assume that the unmet demand is lost instead of backlog. So both of these papers established the optimality of base log policies, which is really nice. For us, we actually located at an inter intersection of these three areas. We studied a dual source capacity expansion problem with demand forecast updates, and more importantly, we assume back order instead of lost sale. And for capacity expansion, back ordering is actually a much more difficult case to handle because you do need extra state space to keep track of the back order level. So therefore, we will going to demonstrate, we're going to demonstrate some different results from this previous work. I first took a theoretical approach. I want to see whether it's possible to model a, you know, a theoretical uh, a, a model and to find out the structural results and out, out, optimal policy, right? So I deliberately choose a, the most simple case where the uh, fractal mode and the base mode has zero one consecutive lead time. The idea is, if for the simplest possible scenario, we still cannot identify a nicely behaved policy, then just forget about the general case where the lead times are non-consecutive because it will definitely get more complex. So some design variables, Bn here and Fn is a base and flexible orders placed in each period. That's the design variable. Xn is an on time capacity level at the beginning of a period M. Yn is a backward quantity from the previous period. We assume demand Dn follows a martingale model of forecast evolution, MMFE, and in particular, it's a function of three components, mu n, which is a constant that is known to us, and epsilon 1, epsilon 2, which are the two market information <coughs> that will get realized at a different stage within a period. Okay, I call it the initial and the final market information. So given these notations, the sequence of events within a certain period is, at the very beginning, the firm will observe Xn, which is the on-hand capacity position, and also Bn minus 1, which is the base order he placed in the previous period. Remember, there is a one period lead time for the base mode. He also observed Yn, which is a back order quantity from the previous period, and also epsilon 1, which is the initial market information. And based on this, he updates his belief about the demand Dn. So then he orders Fn and Bn, he places these orders. Right after that, all the FN arrives because we mentioned that the flexible mode has a zero lead time in this case. It, it will just arrive instantaneously after being placed. All the BN minus one also arrives, which is the base, base order that the firm placed in the previous period. So towards the end of the uh, period, the epsilon two, which is the final market information, also gets realized, and demand DN is realized. 
and the production is exercised. So that is the sequence of events within a period. So based on this, we are able to construct a dynamic programming model. Okay? So the two decision variables we choose in this DP model is the optimal expanded to capacity position. That is x and prime, x and double prime, which denotes the capacity position after we place the order from the two supply modes. Right? It's just a, a simple trick. It's like what we did with inventory control. We assume demand is in additive form, simply the summation of the three components. And with this assumption, we are able to combine epsilon one, which is the initial market information, with the backward quantity ym, and create another um, state variable, which is a modified backward level ym tilde. So now, we have this DP recursion, right? So it has two set of variables, x and prime, uh, x and tilde, which is a capacity position, y and tilde, which is the modified backlog error. So each period at n, the firm will determine the two expansion capacity position, x and prime and x and double prime, right? That is the capacity position after he ordered it from the two supply modes to maximize, to maximize his profit of Vn, where this Vn is given by the expectation over revenue, which is a margin Pn times the quantity he can sell. The quantity is simply the minimum of demand and capacity on hand, right? Subtract by all the costs, which includes an ordering cost from the two supply modes, and then a holding cost of the on-hand capacity. And then finally, plus the expected profit to go, which is given by this bare maturation. And we have formulas to update the two state variables correspondingly. So, Actually, this model is not very easy to analyze analytically. But anyway, we're able to get this uh, results. So this proposition says that for the flexible mode, okay, for the quick mode, there is a state-dependent based on policy, and it is optimal. So simply look at this 3D graph. Focus on these two uh, this horizontal axis and this vertical axis. This horizontal one is the initial capacity position, and this Vertical one is the optimal expansion capacity level. That is our decision, right? So this lower level bottom, uh, this lower level red solid line denotes the policy with the, the flexible mode. As you can see, there is a based on policy, right? If your initial capacity position is below a certain level, you always add up to a constant level. And if it's beyond that threshold, you don't add anything from flexible mode. For the base mode, however, based on policy fails. We only identify a partial based on policy. That is. When your initial capacity position is really low, yes, you are up to a certain level. But beyond that point, the optimal expansion capacity position associated with the base mode can actually be decreasing in the initial uh, in the initial capacity level, and that decreasing trend is even more uh, obvious from the second graph. So this says that a nicely behaved base of policy is not optimal for both supply modes, right? So we conclude that. The dynamic dual source capacity expansion problem with back order is categorically different and more complex than its inventory counterpart, as well as the dynamic dual source capacity expansion problem with lost cells. And remember, this is the simplest situation with zero one consecutive lead time, right? If we generalize this to the non consecutive lead time case, it will just go crazy. And we're never we're, we're, we're never going to be able to identify all the policy. So therefore, we decided to come up with a heuristic solution to help Intel tackle the problem. DMAP heuristic, a dual mode equivalent protein heuristic. So by using a heuristic approach, I can also generalize the problem a lot and take it into some new elements and make the problem more you know, fun and also more useful. So this DMAP heuristic that I constructed actually contains three layers. The top strategic layer, we have this contract negotiation problem or contract selection problem. So basically, Intel determines the best lead time and price combination from the contract manual provided by the equipment supply. So what happens is, usually the equipment supply will go to Intel and say, if you want a one quarter lead time, you have to pay this price. If you want a two quarter lead time, we can decrease the price a little bit. So they will give us a bunch of selections, right? So how do we choose the best alternative from this contract manual? So this stage address that problem. And then at the tactical level, we have a reservation problem where Intel determines the total equipment amount to reserve through both supply modes, BT and FT. Remember I mentioned that we want to share risk with suppliers by reserving the, uh, the capacity beforehand. So this is a stage, right? We pay some reservation fee and reserve some quantity BT FT. As long as our future ordering quantity does not exceed this reservation level, Intel has to be able to meet all the orders that we placed, right? 
So this BTFT therefore serves as the upper limit of the total order quantity that Intel can place in the future across the entire planning horizon. So then we move to the bottom operational level. We have the execution problem. During every period n, faced with a forecast revision updates, right? Intel dynamically determines how much equipment to actually order from both reservation pools. The decision here is BI and IBI at period I. So this is the three layers of the DMAP heuristic. So before I you know, go into detail and explaining the three levels, I want to first talk about this forecast revision mechanism. So how do we actually capture the demand forecast update? We use the idea of range forecast. So basically, the demand forecast is not just a point estimate. Right? It is a, a distribution, has a mean and a variance. So when we try to forecast the demand for a certain period, for a certain uh, angle period, let's say period zero, as time goes on, we not just we not not only just update our mean forecast for that period's demand, but also there is a variance associated with that our forecast, which actually shrinks as we approach that certain period, right? because the demand forecast gets more and more accurate as we you know approach the moment of truth. So this interval between these dashed curves denotes the forecast variance that decreases over time. And symmetrically, if we mirror this process to the other side, <coughs> when we stand at the same period of zero and trying to make the demand forecast for all the future periods, similarly, we not just forecast the mean demand, but also we forecast the demand variance, which diverges as we go, go into the future. Right? That, be, that means that you become less and less confident about your forecast as you forecast further into the future. So this is how we capture you know, Intel, how, how Intel actually <coughs> make the demand forecast revisions. <coughs> With this in mind, we're now able to uh, explain the three levels. So let's start from the bottom layer, the oper operational layer, right? And look at the execution problem first. I will use this execution table to explain how we actually help Intel to make the specific ordering decision at every period based on the forecast revision that we get. Okay. So let's say there are six periods in the selling horizon, period one to period six. We assume there is a four period lead time associated with a base mode, and there is a two periods lead time associated with a flexible mode. And that means that starting from period minus three, Intel has to make the plan, because lead time, the base mode has four called lead time. That's the time you need to start placing orders from the base mode, right? So what happens at period minus three is, Intel will simply ask the marketing department for the latest demand forecast profile. So all the mules and all the CVs, remember what we discussed in previous slides, the, the red curve and the, the, the interval. So the means and the variance. We get a bunch of them, which is the demand forecast profile. And then based on this demand forecast profile, we solve a stochastic problem, taking B1 to B6, F1 to F6, as the 12 decision variables, with the objective function to of maximizing our total sales profit across the entire selling horizon. So after we solve this problem, we get all the values, but we only commit to B1, we only place order B1. Because standing at the period of minus three, that is the only order we need to commit to. We still have chances to reorder for the other periods later on, right? when we really approach that period. So we erase all the rest, 11 decisions, and we move to next period. At period minus two, what happens is Intel will ask the marketing department for the updated demand forecast profile. So we'll get a bunch of new meals <coughs> and new cities based on that forecast revision mechanism. And then fix this B1, because B1 has already been placed in the previous period. So this becomes a constant constraint, right? So then we solve another stochastic program with B2 to B6, <coughs> F1 to F6 as the 11 decision variable. And after we get that, we only commit to B2, the similar idea because that's the only order we need, to, we need to commit at this current stage. We move to period minus one, we get the latest demand forecast profile, the new mules, new series, we, saw, we fix both B1 and F and B2 because both of them have been placed. And we solve another stochastic uh, program with B3 to B6, F1 to F6 as decisions. And the difference here is, at this period, we will commit to not just B3, but also F1. Because st standing at period minus one, and knowing that the lead time for the flex mode is two quarter, two periods. That is actually the first time you have a chance to place an order from the flex mode for the first period. And you can imagine that if this mu one minus one here is a lot higher than the previous mean forecast, 
you will observe a non-negative F1 being placed in this period, and that is a value of flexibility. So this idea will go on and on. We will, we will just uh, you know, use this floating horizon type of idea. But if you hit any period in the selling horizon, you make slight change. That is, you will replace the demand forecast with the actual demand realization. But the, the similar idea carries on. Right? So with this rolling horizon algorithm, we're able to dynamically capture the latest demand information and help Intel to make the you know, ordering decisions you know, uh, dynamically. So just a quick glance at the stochastic program that I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to the math detail to save time. So, uh, but basically, we use a Monte Carlo simulation method, a sample average approximation to solve this problem. And you can actually show that this can be converted into LP and can be just, uh, solved very efficiently. So we want to demonstrate some numerical na analysis, very hard level summary. Okay. So for the stationary demand case, that is, if if the company never updates the demand forecast profile, that's the stationary case. We will see that the company will only order from the cheap mode. So in that case, flexibility doesn't really matter. You only worry about the price, which, which mode is cheaper, you order from that. However, if in, as, in reality, in, as in reality, the company do update the demand forecast profile, which corresponds to a non-stationary demand case, for that situation, the ordering scheme is captured by this graph here. So the horizontal axis is a ratio between the flexible ordering cost and the base ordering cost. What it says that is if the flexible mode is, is cheaper, right, the ratio is less than one, then the company will only order from the flexible mode. Because the flexible mode is not just cheap but also faster, right? So why not? However, if flexible mode is more expensive, which is more reali realistic to assume, the company will use a mixed portfolio, right? If two things happen, if one of the two things happens, one is there is a forecast shock, which is a mean <coughs> forecast jump for a certain future period. Remember that in the previous table, I explained that if the mean forecast for current period is a lot higher than your previous demand forecast, you will order a flex quantity. So that is the forecast shock. The other is a realization shock, which is a higher than expected realized demand. So if there is a very high realized demand, which causes some back order into the future periods, you may also want to order from the flexible mode to capture those backlog quantity as early as possible, because we mentioned that the margin is actually decreasing. So you don't want to you know, wait until too late. So that is a very high level summary for execution problem. Now let's move to the reservation problem and see how we can help Intel determine uh, the reservation levels, BT and FT. <coughs> So we choose BT and FT to maximize the expected horizon-wise profit over all possible demand evolution scenarios. So what do I mean by the demand, all possible demand evolution scenarios? Remember that standing at the beginning of the planning horizon, when we try to make the reservation decision, we actually only know this initial forecast profile, which is represented by this red solid line. That's the only information we know, right? And of course, there's a, a variance associated with that line. <coughs> So what we do is we actually look at the Intel historic forecasting data and we observe that you know, as time goes on, Intel tends to adjust its previous demand forecast either up or down by certain percentage. So we actually make a, a Markovian assumption here. Right? We assume that the forecast profile will actually evolve according to a Markovian process. And based on that, we generate tens of thousands of possible evolution sample passes for this initial forecast profile. Right? And then, we choose the BT and FT to maximize the expected profit across these tens of thousands of evolution scenarios, uh, demand, how to say, forecast evolution sample passes, right? The same idea. So we can also you know, describe this, pro the, this, this problem as a stochastic program, right? We basically choose the optimal BT and FT to maximize the expected horizon-wise profit, which is given by the, this execution level profit subtracted by the reservation price we have to pay up front. If we assume linear, then it's RBBT and IFFT. And this expect, expectation here is taken over that tens of thousands of possible demand forecast evolution sample passes. I call it the forecast evolution space, M. So that is the comprehensive stochastic program. But again, we can use non color simulation, we can use sample average approximation to solve this problem, and we can actually prove that this reservation problem is coercive and concave in the two decisions, BT and FT, which guarantees a finite solution for us, which is good. 
So I want to show some numerical analysis for this reservation level problem uh, to demonstrate the impact of the key model parameters on our decision. For example, this slide shows the impact of a forecast uncertainty. We have two, we choose two parameters to denote the uncertainty of the forecast. One is beta, which is the mean forecast jump. Right? Remember I said every period we assume the demand can jump, the, the mean demand can jump up or down by better percent or remain the same with certain probabilities. That beta denotes how big that jump is. And gamma is the forecast variance coefficient. So basically once we fix the mean forecast, there is a variance that you know, interval between those two dashed curves. That is uh, gamma here. So we show that as either beta or gamma increase, the firm tends to reserve more base, more flex, and more importantly, the flex reservation ratio, which is Ft divided by Bta plus Ft, right? the portion that the flex reservation captures among the total reservation pool. That ratio also increase as beta or gamma increase. Basically, this says that Flexibility is more and more valuable if the demand becomes more and more uncertain. Right? Here, this slide we demonstrate the impact of price. We choose two parameters to control the price of the flexible load. One is lambda, or one is theta, which is a flexible cost increase ratio. So basically, how much more expensive is the total cost of the flexible load, which com which consists of a reservation fee and the execution fee, right? And then another parameter is lambda which is the flexible reservation ratio, that is, among the total cost you have to pay for the flexible mode, how much percentage you have to pay upfront at the reservation stage as a reservation fee. And we demonstrate that as either lambda or theta increase, the firm will rely more on the base mode, less on the flexible mode, and the flexible reservation ratio also decreases. This is very reasonable, right? This basically says that flexibility values less if it's more expensive. So then the last slide here shows the impact of lead time and service level. So the, the left panel demonstrates that as the lead time of the flexible mode increase from zero to four, where the four period is actually the same lead time as the base mode, the company will you know, strictly reduce their reservation from the flexible mode all the way down to zero. And meanwhile, that will depend more and more on the base mode. And also notice that when the lead time of flexible mode increase, the variability of the profit of the expected profit also increase dramatically. So which, well, which makes sense because you know, the flexible mode is, well, another function of flexible mode is help us to dampen the risk, right? dampen the, the variance of the, of the profit. So the right panel here shows the impact of service level target. We demonstrate that, we demonstrate that as we, the company move the service level target from 88% to 99%, they will rely more on base and flex and also the flexible reservation ratio increase sharply. So which means that flexibility means more if the company wants to achieve a high service level. But there's one interesting thing we want to point out. If we don't consider reputation or market share or you know, other concerns, only focus on profit, you can actually see that the profit associated with a 99% service level is almost <coughs> 200 million US dollars less than that associated with a 95% service level. So basically, it means company actually are compromising a non-trivial portion of their profit to maintain a very high service level. And we think this trade-off should be seriously taken into consideration by the decision makers, right? So service level, profit, there should be a trade-off. So our model can actually help, help them to quantify this trade-off. So that's, I think, another side contribution of this heuristic. So finally, let's come to the strategic level, the contract negotiation problem, right? How do we help Intel to select the best contract offer from the manual provided by the equipment supplier? Idea is simple, we use a sensitivity analysis to come up with some simple um, isoprofit curves on this lead time price quadrant. So if you look at this graph, every sort of line here denotes an isoprofit curve. <coughs> so each contract manual, each contract term on this isoprofit curve leads to the same expected profit for the supplier, for, oh, sorry, for Intel, for the firm. If you look at contract A, which has a one quarter lead time for the base, for the flex mode, and you have to pay 14% upfront at the reservation stage, it leads to the same expected profit with the other three contract terms in the red circles here. For example, this one with two quarter lead time and 10% upfront payment, right? And if you want to compare A with B, which has 
In long to lead time, but a cheaper price, it's not trivial to say which one is better, right? But if you notice, D actually lies on an absolute profit curve that leads to a smaller profit than the curve that A lies on. Then we can confidently say that if company cares about the expected profit, then we can choose A over B. A dominates B in this case, right? And similarly, in Scraf, C dominates D. So I think this too can help Intel, you know, function as a decision support to help Intel compare the different contract items offered by the equipment supplier. A quick summary for the first part. We showed that a dual-mode procurement strategy can be an effective solution to firm's capital procurement problems. We showed that flexible mode is especially useful when there is a demand forecast shock or when there is a demand realization shock. The flexible reservation quantity decreases in its price. Both the base and the flexible reservation quantities increase in demand uncertainty and the service level target. We also demonstrate that isoprofit curves can help the firm select contract offers. Before I move on, I want to show you guys a paragraph from a letter written by uh, Robert Brock, the VP of Intel, to the editor-in-chief of Amazon to support our submission of an application paper based on this research. As you can see, Robert says that the dual-mode procurement approach described in this paper is being used <coughs> at the strategic and tactical level today at Intel for all fabrication equipment and will soon be used at the operational level. The annual savings on capital procurement at Intel due to implementing BMAP are estimated to exceed tens of millions of dollars. So hopefully this can somehow justify the value of this research. So now, let's switch anger and talk about the selling problem, right? A strategic capacity allocation problem in commodity trading with a small market. The motivation is from a totally different industry. We're looking at the iron ore industry here. So iron ore, the fundamental element of iron and uh, steel, right? People used to manufacture cars, contract buildings. There is a large market size for this industry. In 2010, the Seagull iron ore market reached a historic revenue size of 88 billion US dollars. This, this industry is oligopoly. There are big three suppliers, Bell from Brazil, Rio Tinto and BHP Bulletin from uh, Australia. They control two thirds of the world's iron ore supply. And these suppliers used to trade through the fixed price contract only. So business for them used to be simple. The reason is clients for them were mostly state-owned steel manufacturers that had largely predictable business and they usually prefer long-term relationship with iron ore suppliers to minimize their procurement risk. So in the past, the iron ore suppliers only need to sell these quantities through the negotiated fixed price contract channel, right? And that's it. But nowadays, recently, changes happened. So the demand from Asian countries, especially China, increased dramatically over the past several years. And therefore, the quantity negotiated through the fixed price channel are not sufficient to cover all the demand on the market. And because of that, some spot markets emerged where some local small suppliers filled the gap between the demand and supply at a higher spot price. The spot price is higher than the fixed, fixed uh, price channel. Right? So, and this actually implies a potential loss of profit for the big suppliers because they could have allocated a part of their capacity to the spot channel as well and reap a high profit. Right? So the challenge for the larger commodity suppliers in this context is how should they efficiently utilize both the fixed price channel and the spot channel to enhance revenue, given that they have a constrained production capacity. We add more specifications to simplify and also define the problem. We study a case where one supplier, right, one big supplier with capacity K, sells through both a fixed price channel, which has price W, and a spot channel, which has an uncertain price. So he allocates his capacity between these two channels. We assume that there are some large buyers with a random aggregate demand D here. They source from the fixed price channel first because they usually want to minimize the, their procurement risk. And then if there is still some unsatisfied demand, those demand may switch to the spot market. Okay. So we assume there are some small local suppliers, some small local buyers that are acting on the spot market and they contribute to some default spot supply curve and demand curves. We will explain later on. So then our supply here determines an optimal allocation scheme of his capacity to maximize his revenue from both channels. So, right, I think it's a straightforward setting. 
So I take an initial step by investing, oh sorry, briefly mention the literature. So three areas of literature are related. One is the spot market. So people have you know, been uh, modeling an open spot market where the price follows an exogenous random distribution. Some other people such as VN1, 2002, they actually model a closed spot market where the spot price is the balanced outcome of demand and supply on the market. Another area is two channels uh, distribution strategies. I listed several papers here. Most of these guys study uh, the difference between a traditional channel and an online direct channel, so which is a little bit different from the case we're studying here. And the third area is quantity-based revenue management. So basically, how can a firm adjust its quantity decision to maximize revenue given that the quantity has an impact on price? So our work actually locates at the intersection of the three areas. So I took an initial step by investigating a preliminary model where I assume the spot market is open. Basically, I assume the demand, the spot price and the demand follow a bivariate normal distribution, which is given by this description here. So the mean and uh, the mean value for the, for the uh, price and demand are mu s, uh, mu d, and then there are some variance sigma s, sigma d, and there is a correlation coefficient rule associated with the demand and the price. So given this, the supply's optimal profit right, function is simply you know, this, uh, this guy. The supply choose the optimum quantity to allocate to the, to the contract channel, to the fixed price channel, which is lambda, to maximize his total expected profit. Right? And notice that this lambda has to be between 0 and k, where k is his capacity limit. So his profit is given by his revenue from the contract channel, which is w, the fixed price channel price times by the multiplied by the quantity he can sell, which is the minimum, minimum of lambda d, and then plus the revenue he get from the spot channel, which is the spot price multiplied by the leftover the leftover capacity that he allocates to the spot channel by k minus the quantity he sold at the contract channel, and subtracted by a linear production cost. So we can actually analyze this problem and identify that if rho is positive, that means that if the spot price and the demand, the contract channel demand, is positively correlated. Then the profit function for the supply is quasi-concave, and a dual-channel strategy may be optimal. So that is captured by lambda hat, which denotes the optimum quantity that the supply should allocate to the contract channel. And that quantity is given, is solved by this complex formula here. However, if a rule is negative, which means that if the demand and price are negatively correlated, right, in that case, the objective function of the supply is quasi-convex, and the single channel strategy is optimal. So the supply will simply either allocate all capacity to the contract channel or all capacity to the spot channel depending on the parameter values. So this is the initial investigation on an open spot market case, which is not that interesting. So we switch to a closed spot, a closed spot market scenario where we investigate a case that the, the supply's quantity decision can actually have an impact <coughs> on the equitable spot price. So what I did is I divided this, the single period into two different stages. So stage one is the contract trading stage. In this stage, the supplier allocates quantity lambda, which has to be strictly less than or equal to its capacity K to the contract channel before seeing the contract demand D. And after that, D realized, and the minimum of D and lambda is satisfied through the contract channel at the fixed price W, right? And then, if there is still some unsatisfied demand, d minus lambda plus, we assume that a portion, theta, a theta portion of those demand, will switch to the spot market. Okay. And the reason I put a theta here is, usually there are some other channels, some other markets that demand can go to. They don't have to all go to this, this spot market. So this theta is usually between zero and one. And this shift over quantity, shift over demand to the spot market, can potentially affect the default spot demand curve. We mentioned that there are some, spot, uh, some small suppliers and buyers on the spot market, and there are some default curves, right? So this shifting uh, demand can affect that demand curve. And the second stage, stage two, is the spot trading stage. So what happens here is, knowing how much quantity are allocated to the contract channel in the first stage, that is lambda, also observing the demand realization D, the supplier then shifts quantity lambda s, which has to be less than or equal to his leftover capacity, that is k minus the minimum of the d and lambda, right? The quantity he sold through the contract channel. 
to sell on the spot market. And this supply, uh, this spot supply quantity lambda S can also potentially shift the spot supply curve. Given this, the equilibrium of spot price PS is determined by the intersection of the new demand and supply curve. And in particular, it's given by this equation PS equals A plus B D minus lambda plus minus G lambda S. So just bear with me, this is the equilibrium spot price. How do we get it? We will explain that in the next slide. So the supply's total profit is therefore given by its profit from the contract channel, which is a margin W minus C, times the contract trading quantity, the minimum of a DM lambda. Then plus its profit from the spot channel, which is the margin PS minus C, times its spot trading quantity lambda S. And this PS is given by this equation. Okay. So how do we get that equilibrium spot price? As I mentioned, we assume there are some small suppliers and small buyers on the market which contribute to some default de demand curve and supply curve on the spot market, D0 and F S0 here. Right? If you're familiar with the microeconomic theory, demand curve is usually decreasing functions, supply curve is increasing functions, so we have some uh, linear uh, description for demand and supply curves, the default ones, the so demand gamma minus delta PS, supply minus alpha plus delta PS. So then, when the capacity allocation decision has been made, we mentioned that some demand will switch over to the spot, spot, uh, spot market, right? So then for the, for the demand curve, it will be shifted to the right by the spilled over demand that comes to the spot market. So which means that this D0 will be shifted right by theta D minus lambda plus. So we arrive at this new demand curve. And similarly, when a company, when a firm allocates lambda S to the spot market, that quantity will also shift the original supply curve from S0 to S by omega lambda s. Why I introduce a parameter omega here? If omega is greater than one, that denotes that there may be some emulation behavior from some local suppliers. If I see a big supplier is allocating a lot of quantity to the market, it may signal that the market is really good. So I may want to also increase my quantity a little bit. However, if omega is less than one, that implies there may be a resource competition between the suppliers. If the larger supplier is allocating a lot of quantity to the spot market, I may not be able to allocate as much. So this parameter adjusts what is the effect of that shift impact of lambda S. So given this, we can actually determine the equilibrium spot price, which is simply the intersection of the demand and supply curves. Right? And how we get this PS, we jointly solve these two equations, and we arrive at this formula for PS. And we do some variable substitution for uh, these complex coefficients. So we arrive at that A plus B minus G equation. So this is how we solved the equivalent of spot price. So with this in mind, we're now able to analyze the problem. So remember, we have a two-stage decision problem. So we're going to use backward, backward induction to solve the problem. At the second stage, so we look at the second stage first. The second stage, supply is nose lambda nose D, and simply choose lambda S to maximize his second stage profit. Right? And lambda S is constrained by his left, leftover capacity which is k minus mean of d and lambda. So his pro profit in the second stage is the margin on the spot market, PS minus C, times the spot trading quantity lambda S. And this PS is given by the previous formula. You can actually prove this problem. This problem is quadratic, concave. It's nicely behaved. So we have actually an optimal solution. And remember that we have up limit boundary in the, uh, the optimal decision. So we actually end up with several different cases depending on different range of lambda and D, we have different specific expression for the, for the optimal value that the supply allocates to the spot market. But basically, we can cap capitalize the optimal solution for the second stage very well. And now with this comprehensive uh, decision in the second stage, we can go back to the first stage and solve for the first stage decision problem. At, this, at the first stage, with a full contingent plan for the second stage based on the previous analysis, the supply choose the optimal lambda between zero and his capacity k to maximize his expected profit over the entire period. Right? It choose lambda between zero k to maximize pi is one, where pi is one is simply the expectation of the demand d, right? And then his profit from the contract trading stage w minus c times the minimum of d and lambda, and then plus his profit from the spot trading stage. This pi is two. Lambda lambda s is simply the second stage profit. And here, this lambda s star 
remember, it is given by that comprehensive solution that we explained in the previous slides, right, that full contingent plan. So we simply can plug that into this lambda S star and, and come up with a very complex mass formula. I will ignore the, you know, skip the mass here, but basically you can use a bunch of uh, <coughs> integrals to express the expected profit in the first stage. So I will directly jump, jump, jump over that mass and come to the conclusion for this part. We demonstrate that if we assume theta is less than nine quarter omega, which is usually the case because I said that some of the demand will always go to other channels, will get lost. So theta is usually strictly less than one. And omega is usually just one. Yes, there can be emulation behavior, there can be resource competition, but you know, usually it's just one. So this condition actually usually holds, and we can show that the supply first stage expected profit function is convex concave in lambda on the interval zero k with at most one interior maximizer lambda hat. So this basically is captured by this curve, right? Convex, concave, <coughs> which has at most one interior optimi optimizer. So this says that in the first stage, the supplier only needs to compare at most two decisions. One is zero, the other is this lambda hat, which can actually be solved by first order condition, right? Which one leads to a high profit, we will just go with that allocation strategy. And then we also carry out some comparative comparative step uh, analysis to demonstrate how would the model parameters affect the key decision variables, as well as the three, the, you know, the several uh, optimal price associated with different, uh, different decision points. I will just demonstrate two examples here. So this left panel here shows the impact of theta and omega, right, the two very important parameters. The curve here shows the quantity, the optimum quantity that the firm should allocate to the contract channel. And you can see, as theta increase, the firm allocates less quantity to the contract channel and more quantity to the spot channel. As omega increase, oppositely, the firm allocates less, uh, more quantity to the contract channel and less quantity to the spot channel. Okay. So this, the right panel here shows the impact of the, demand, the mean demand mu d and demand variability is sigma d. For the business setting that we identified, it says that as mu d increase, roughly the firm will allocate less quantity to the contract channel and more to the spot channel. And similarly, if sigma d increase, if you read, read from here to here, right, the firm will also allocate less to the contract channel and more to the spot channel. So this is just some examples of the comparative status results. I will provide some manager insights for this uh, commodity trading model. We show that the supply's capacity allocation decision has a due impact on the equilibrium spot price by affecting both the spot demand curve and the spot supply curve. In the first stage, a dual channel policy is optimal if theta is less than or equal to omega. Right? The stronger the local supply's emulation behavior, which is denoted by a larger omega, or the more sourcing options the buyers have, which is denoted by a smaller theta, the more quantity the supply should allocate to the contract channel. And if the demand variability sigma d is higher, then the supply should reserve more capacity for the spot market as the mean demand increase, with the hope of driving more demand to the spot channel and creating a potentially high spot price. And for the second stage, remember we showed that the, the problem is quadratic and concave, we show that it's not necessarily optimal to allocate all leftover capacity to the spot market. You may just want to allocate part of your leftover capacity to the spot market. Finally, the contribution of, the, of my dissertation. So I developed a comprehensive framework to structure the multi-stage decision hierarchy and capture the real-world dynamics and the constraints for the equipment procurement problem in capital-intensive industries. We show that the dynamic dual source capacity expansion problem with back order is different from and more complex than its inventory counterpart, as well as the dual source capacity expansion problem with lost cells. Okay. And we propose an efficient demand heuristic to solve the above problem in a general setting where the demands are non consecutive. We modeled and analyzed a strategic capacity allocation problem in, glo in global commodity trading and recommended to the commodity supplier the optimal way to utilize both a fixed price contract channel and a spot market. So that is the contribution. Um, finally, the acknowledgement. 
I want to thank Professor Lai for being my committee chair, despite how busy he is. I want to thank uh, Dr. Carl Kempfer for flying all the way from Phoenix to Stanford to sit in my defense. And Dr. Kempfer has provided a lot of help during my project with Intel, so thank you very much. I want to thank Professor Hausman uh, for being in my reading committee and uh, for providing me uh, guidance and advice for my research all these years. I want to sincerely, sincerely thank both of my, my advisors, Professor Hu and Professor Lee, for not just being great advisors and role models, but also being a very good friend of mine. Uh, I really benefit a lot from the incisive instructions you guys provided to both of my research and my career life, so thank you very much. I want to thank Intel Corporation and the Rio Tinto Group for providing industry support to my research, my MSE friends, uh, especially those who are here today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> without you guys, I'm, I'm pretty sure the process will be much more miserable. I want to thank my Chinese friends. You make, this pro you make this place feel like home all the time. I want to thank Stanford University. I think this is a, the simple best place to be on this planet. You know, I would never <laughs> consider graduating if I can make more money as a PhD student. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank my wife, Wen Yi, and my parents. Uh, they are not here today, but without their love, support, and a sacrifice, I can never achieve this. So thank you very much. Thank you.